This is the uh, session on disrupting the status quo. It's a very broad uh, title for this, which you'll see why in a moment. So I'm Angie with the Center for Cultural Innovation here with this um, initiative called Ambitious. Each one of you are up here because you're doing something disruptive. But before you start, I actually want to give you our definition of how we're seeing disruption, just as a way to frame this up. So we're not looking at disruption as, as it would be innovation for innovation's sake. Like just because it's new or something untried, that's not good enough. What we're looking for are things where, are activities where there is clearly a market there for the things that you're doing. Um, and that has been largely untapped, not from like an enterprise point of view, but in terms of a market that would drive social change and, and behavioral change. Okay, so Crux is um, a new cooperative, um, very, very new. We're like a little baby. We just were born two days ago, um, thanks to uh, Francesca <laughs> and Jason's, uh, and her colleague Jason's work. Um, but what we really are exploring is um, Immersive storytelling, so for those of you who don't know, we're talking about virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, location-based sort of entertainment experiences um, that are, we're really at the very um, sort of bleeding edge of where storytelling is going and where our world is going. Um, and we're working to get black artists sort of um, deeply embedded in that, in that work. Um, and so we're supporting every, we're supporting artists from, um, from education and sort of awareness and education. So how do you get it in play with these tools? Um, the cost of them is, ranges from being relatively inexpensive, a $299 360 video camera, all the way up to you know, tens of thousands of dollars for sort of a, a high-end sort of volumetric video uh, experience. Um, the VR, AR industry is poised to be about a 41 billion industry in the next three to four years. Um, there are no black people really working on, I should say there are a lot of thinkers, but no one's really thinking about how do we organize um, to really capture how, um, how we're going to operate in those spaces. So a couple of just quick data points. Um, several years ago, a study was done that said when, um, when black and brown kids play um, immersive games online, 40% uh, of them play as white male avatars because they've already um, experienced racism and sexism in virtual spaces. Um, if you happen to see Ready Player One with the Oasis, um, for, uh, Facebook announced that they have essentially built the, the Oasis last month when we were at Oculus 6. Oculus 6. Um, and so you have a company like Facebook really building the worlds that we're all going to inhabit um, moving into the future. So um, I'm concerned about that um, and really see Crux as being uh, an opportunity for us to get in early as opposed to being an afterthought like we have in the film industry. Films been around for 110 years. We're just now talking about Oscar So White. So what happens if we get in at the beginning um, and really try to, to, sort of, uh, to sort of get in right now and, and make our impact felt? OK. Yeah. I want to talk more about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know we'll come back to it. Um, so the Boston Impact Initiative, the, the disruption, there's a surface level. The disruption level is deeper and more abstract and a little hard to get at. The surface level is Boston Impact is a place-based integrated capital fund focused on closing the racial wealth divide. Um, we are, you know, and, and, and uh, the Boston Ujima Project is something that we helped design and co-create. So the design of what we did where you're democratizing the, in the capital stack so non-accredited investors can participate, shifting, disaggregating capital and power, having entrepreneurs of color and um, working class folks be able to access all kinds of integrated capital. All of those pieces are the core of what we're doing. We've been doing that since 2013. Underneath that, <clears throat> for me, is where the, the, another layer of disruption is, which has to do, <laughs> to go out to left on a limb here for a minute, has to do with biomimicry and finance. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is, um, we are still operating collectively in dominant culture from a industrial or mechanical mindset about the world, where the world is perceived as causal, linear, and predictable, and we design the tools that support the world for extraction, profit maximization, resource extraction, growth and efficiency all measured through quarterly returns, the heart of our capitalist model. Then you've got the world of impact investing trying to do something better based on that same root system. Nothing in that ideology is different except to talk about, let's say, for example, the popular word concessionary. When you talk about concessionary returns, concessionary to a paradigm that's fundamentally flawed and you're not changing the root belief system, so then there's all this 
yay, concessionary investing going on out there, which means like that we haven't changed anything. So, so the question that we're in is, what is a real disruption to our habituated way of thinking about finance, which is really like water to an ecosystem, right? Where it flows, mm -hmm. people thrive. Where it doesn't flow, people uh, organisms wither and shrivel. Mm -hmm. Biomimicry is the notion of what can we learn from nature about how you create thriving ecosystems for all organisms. And we are in the inquiry about how do you design finance to work like nature, right? So nature um, invests in the whole system. Nature is compelled toward biodiversity. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are things, and I'll just give you one example, and then we can maybe get into this later, because I, I know the abstraction is a little difficult. But in, um, so, so one example for how we use it is we're a place-based fund, uh, a mature uh, hardwood forest in New England grows at a rate of 3 to 4% a year. A bamboo forest grows at a rate of 35% a year, colonizes everything in its path to destroying all subspecies. Does that sound like Wall Street? Mm -hmm. Right? So, so when you think about designing risk and return, designing a return, on what basis do you select a return? It can't be a basis that compares to the previous market mm -hmm. because that paradigm, we've seen what that paradigm has given in it. So if we can design, in my place, a 3% return on a note, for example, mm -hmm. that's, mo that's modeling with nature. And then we can also look at, like, what is the role of incumbent institutions, the big institutions like oak trees? What are the roles of network institutions like fungal networks? So anyway, there's a lot of abstraction there. Maybe we can explore it. But the, 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 the takeaway for me is how do we fundamentally shift our lens around where we look for modeling for finance that can support thriving local ecosystems, which means including all of us. Mm -hmm. Great. I want to riff on the biomimicry as, yeah. as an introduction yeah, to yeah. the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is, especially for live stream people, if you like Google our logo real quick or just go to our website, you'll see it includes two um, overlapping nature motifs um, right, baked right into our logo. One is the Twin Pines which is, many of you are familiar with cooperatives. Um, the idea that, uh, that, that trees, their root systems, are actually can grow um, better and have a better chance of survival and, and thriving long term um, by growing up as a cohort together. They lean on each other. Um, they're more resilient in terms of fire and other kinds of elements. So um, that's sort of a uh, classic, especially throughout the Americas, symbol of cooperation is, is the idea of twin twin pines um, growing up together. So we have that. But then we also have this other piece that we um, adapted from the International Worker Co-op movement, which is a flock of birds. Um, in our case, because we're based in North America, as the US Federation of Worker Co-ops, it's uh, Canadian geese, which you would think, OK, yeah, we maybe need to rethink that a little bit. Um, but it turns out that geese, no, actually, flip the script. It turns out that geese don't respect um, borders and don't adhere to that system. Right. So that's very much in, um, in alignment with, with our thinking. Uh, a good chunk of our members are actually immigrants, um, particularly from Latin America um, and the Caribbean. And so, yeah, that's part of it, too. There we go. Um, but the idea is, and our logo says that we go farther, faster, together. Um, that actually the energy expended by any particular um, goose is, um, it takes much less effort to be able to, to, tra to travel at a, um, a scale of migration, you know, continental or intercon intercontinental migration by being tied into a flock, that by, mm -hmm. by flying in the forming V in alignment, mm -hmm. um, that you we're able to cover more distance, expend less energy, and be interdependent um, in a way that is, that's also dynamic. It's the, the leadership within a flock actually shifts. Um, and so that's, that's, that's our origin story. That's where we come from. That's what we do. Um, having uh, been born in 2004, it's our 15 year anniversary now, um, from local ecosystems where worker co-op networks were strong in different pockets of the country. Um, and so we finally sort of came together and formed a national one. And, um, and now we're, we're linking up with, uh, with, with some of our cousins over 
in Europe who have figured out a way of organizing freelancers in a way that we, we do think is genuinely um, disruptive. Um, so Smart EU was started 20 years ago um, by just without any of the tech pieces, just by organizing themselves, um, aggregating their own funds and resources to advocate for their shared interests as freelancers who were doing different work, but primarily in the creative and artist industry. Um, and over time, they built up their own internal capital pool um, for, an, for a guaranteed payment. Um, they built up um, these other systems that they've now codified into a, um, a, a cooperative organization and a platform. So they formalized their cooperative a couple years ago. They're new to the cooperative space and, um, and have since expanded beyond Belgium into France and now Spain and Italy and Hungary and um, Germany. And they're in eight, eight or nine different countries in Western Europe. Um, and they're interested in coming to North America. So what's the opportunity in terms of disruption? Well, uh, we're looking at different reports and statistics that something on the order of 40% of the workforce within 10 years time is gonna be gig in freelance the yeah. in the US, is yeah. gonna be gig freelance and contract workers. So that's a lot of people, right? <laughs> um, and, and currently, I think the freelancers union says there's 53 million people who even just right now identify as freelancers who they organize with. Um, and they're, they're uh, another cousin ally who we collaborate with in doing this work. So putting together what worker cooperatives are doing and what freelancers are doing is sort of the Venn diagram of, the, of this project, which is um, organizing in the US a freelancer um, freelancer owned platform cooperative. Um, we see ownership um, right alongside the business work and the democracy work um, that we were talking about at COCAP yesterday. Um, the Democracy at Work Institute was sort of presenting about this as, as fundamentally um, shifting how we engage business, work, labor, and the conditions of our work. Um, and as the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives, we're the the national grassroots membership organization for worker-owned cooperative businesses in the US. And so we're able to, um, to advocate, to provide technical assistance, guidance, um, and to compare notes and sort of perfect what does it look like to iterate on democracy inside of the workplace and inside of our firms. So we're trying to bring all of those lessons into um, a relatively non-organized space, which is this work around gig and freelance um, labor uh, by pulling them together into a cooperative, um, by building in an ownership component um, of this thing, we can then adapt some of the tools of what SMART has done in the EU, where they now have over 100,000 um, members and users in their, in their platform and in their cooperative, um, and bringing that to the US. So, so there's- Actually, yeah. I'm gonna hold yeah. on, because I wanna ask a question of all of you, all yeah. of, you of like what your projects and your endeavors what you're hoping it'll look like yeah. in just like a couple short years. And actually, I just want to raise of hands really quick. Who here has heard of Smart EU? So a few of you, yeah. Um, as a way to sort of um, lead in, in a very leading way, mm. I'll just say we can continue down this thread. Actually, what do you want us to, to call it? Because I think calling it Smart EU for the US seems really awkward. Do you have a name for it or? In terms of what we're doing here, Right now, it's in R&D phase, but we're just calling it the freelance, the freelance cooperative. The freelance cooperative. Yeah. Okay. Used to me, so I, yeah. I'll, I'll use that terminology. I mean, we, we got interested in this because remembering that our origin story for Ambitious is around <laughs> artists, and so many of them are freelancers, independent workers, yeah. the progenitors of that popularized term gig workers, right? Jazz musicians of the mid-20th century hustling from gig to gig. And in talking also with um, freelancers union, find that the majority, the simple majority of all of their members nationwide are out of the creative industry sector, mm -hmm. right? So this disproportionately affects artists yeah. in the US. And when we first learned about Smart EU, it was like, wow, to collectivize so many independent workers in a way to offer them legal protections, et cetera. So, if, so the question for each of you um, is, what would it look like um, if you can envision like things running successfully in like one to two years. And, um, and Deborah, I would love it if you would also talk about the, the, um, the popularizing of your model work because people often call on you to be like, okay, you're in Boston, we're not in Boston, we wanna do this also. Um, so maybe you could go first, Esteban. Like sure. what, what's the 
practical things that people are going to get out yeah. of this? I think our vision for maybe I'll, I'll go with two years. Okay, yeah, two <laughs> is years. That, is that we're laying the foundation for something that can scale and eventually capture and organize uh, freelancers such that it becomes a no-brainer. If you're a freelancer, you just join on um, as a member and, and beneficiary and owner of this platform. So we're getting at the ownership, the asset building, all of that. But what the, what the platform actually does then is um, it institutes a guaranteed payment fund. So whatever freelance work you're doing, um, your guaranteed payment within a certain amount of time. Our R&D is figuring out what is the amount of time that makes sense in the US market, which is a little different from in Europe. Um, it also, so most tech platforms are market facing and customer facing. The whole conceit of the freelancers cooperative is that it's actually labor facing, it's internal, and it's mostly, it's, it's largely hidden from the market. So where we are trying to find users, it's, it's really just in organizing um, or, or enrolling the freelancers themselves. Well, what, is, what then is the, the benefit to them? We take care of their taxes, their insurance um, liabilities, uh, some of the research that goes into, you know, what kind of visas do you need in order to go do a photo shoot in Russia? Um, what's the different levels of tax liability if you're living in a place like New York City where there's city taxes versus the state level versus federal? What sort of insurance do you need in different industries? So a lot of that stuff is like, whoa, these are creative people who are not very interested in going down a rabbit hole in research and all of that stuff. So it, it takes, it, we, we have professionals set up on the back end to do that, um, in addition to bookkeeping um, and invoicing. And then we then become the bill collectors. So the freelancer isn't, and again, I've been a freelancer, I know what it's like to not invoice your people in a timely way, to sort of drag your feet on that because you're worried about the work or other things, or hustling the next gig. Well, also wage theft. Wage theft. And so the, the, the cooperative itself becomes the workplace that the freelancer, you're now a worker owner or an employee within that cooperative um, where we're chasing down the clients. We are sending those invoices in a timely way. We're sending automated reminders and we're much likely to get, to get that payment. Um, and meanwhile, because we're aggregating everyone else's um, fees that are flowing into the cooperative, we can guarantee that you're getting paid and you don't even have to worry about it. I mean, it takes care, if it works, it'll take care of like, it's guaranteed payment, yeah. right? I mean, that would be huge. Yeah, and then I think beyond that, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of confluence in what we're already doing for worker cooperatives around aggregating um, the needs of the workers themselves and the businesses for uh, collective bargaining. So let's all get health insurance together. Let's all get um, life insurance or liability insurance or different business insurance. Um, there are ways that we could go to market um, and get, you know, let's get QuickBooks software that is at a price point that's, that's um, cheaper because we're all going in on it together. So there's different pieces. You, and I know you haven't gone there, but I mean, it's also a really interesting way of thinking about unions yeah. um, and the collectivizing of their individual voices, right? Um, it's so, it, it, when we first heard about this, it was like, we were, we were thinking around like, how do we have like a 21st century union for creative um, industry uh, workers? And then people were like, no, unions aren't gonna work, what about business models? But I never thought of it as like a co-op model, frankly. It makes a lot of sense. Um, Deborah, would you talk about the work in terms of like how your approach can actually not, it's not about going to steal because people will have to be that market need that's out there. So actually, it is about going to scale, but differently. Differently, right? so, yeah. So the whole notion, you know, we are a $10 million fund. We had a pilot fund that was $3 million. We had a ten, we were in a $10 million fund right now. Um, and there's two things. One is impact in Boston. And to a certain degree, we feel like we can kind of check the box on that. Because when I started in 2013, somebody's like, what's your five-year vision? The same question. I was like, well, I hope we don't exist because big institutions like Eastern Bank and the Boston Foundation have started to deploy capital differently. Mm -hmm. And I would say that we can check that box. They created uh, together BEI, the business equity, BEI, BII. Mm -hmm. um, they hired my managing director. They created a similar fund, and they're doing the same thing. And then, I, you know, LISC has changed their behavior. Axion's changed their behavior. Many folks have come in. The new project with Berkshire Bank and Runway is in the marketplace. So we have, I would say in Boston, the um, scaling in place of multiple diverse, so ecosystem, again, diverse responses to bringing capital, technical assistance, social capital, financial capital, et cetera, 
to entrepreneurs of color is really active, it's got a lot of vitality. So now we're in the other question. People are like, well, what's your next thing? Are you guys going to be a $40 million fund, a $100 million fund? you got to scale up. The answer is, nope, that's not for us to do. Um, again, coming from a systems thinking background, so scaling across where local, or what you might say, translocal learning, so local efforts uniquely determined by the conditions in that community, connected to other local efforts uniquely owned and controlled and designed by people in that community in a meaningful exchange of learning and relationship and including social capital and financial capital can take us to scale. So this idea of scaling across is what we're interested in. And this came for me, I was talking to the, I was raising money for BII and I was talking to the chief investment officer at the Silicon Valley Community Foundation who said he, at the time before everything happened, um, who said he wanted to invest in racial justice financial products and there weren't very many on the marketplace. I was like, oh, we have one and we have a track record. And he's like, A, you're too small. We had a million dollar maximum and um, it was too small. And the other thing, he's like, you know, I don't want to invest in Boston, but if you had a portfolio of multiple places where I could put 10 or 50 million into it, that'd be interesting to me. And so the BII fund building cohort is a community of practice that we're launching next summer. Um, it's people who are inviting us in. So we got, started getting calls a year ago, probably about 30 different communities have called and said, what have you learned about creating place-based integrated capital funds focused on closing the racial wealth divide? And is there anything that you can help us with? And as we started to do a bit of advising and consulting, it became too much. So we're like, let's do this collectively. So there'll be a community of practice of 12 places, um, places like Philadelphia and Albuquerque, among others, um, who are saying, we're, we're ready. We're not in the why or whether inquiry. Mm -hmm. We're in the how. Mm -hmm. And we want to know how can we accelerate each other's either time to market or deepen our impact by learning together better. Um, and some of that is super practical, nuts and bolts. We see ourselves as a how organization. Like we are kind of the wonky side of the work where we have, you know, two years, 30 pro bono lawyers working to create a precedent setting legal structure for doing the type of thing that we do the impact covenant, so legally binding in your term sheet to ensure that enterprise is going to contribute to closing the racial wealth divide, impact measurement that's intersectional, because a lot of the impact measurement tools are not. Mm -hmm. um, and so being able to really advance those types of questions, and of course, all of the pieces that we've been learning in partnership with Ujima around what is the role of governance and democracy and participation. That's not what we do, but we can point to best practices and ways of engaging in that. So ultimately, five years down the road, there is a network of locally self-determined place-based integrated capital funds focused on closing the racial wealth divide that will be very different from each other, but that bigger pots of capital can flow into the network. And then this is getting into, again, the wonky side on the legal piece. The money can come into the network, but the balance sheets for each place are not tied together so that Chicago is not dependent on Detroit's performance. They have separate control, but the capital can flow through the network in aggregate. So that's what we're aiming for. Great. Thank you. Um, OK, my brain's exploding. Like, <laughs> um, like subversively, like I'm always trying to like tear shit down. Um, so I'm going to, OK. Um, so in five years, um, my goal is to have black people interact with technology in an entirely different way. Um, so for us, technology happens to us. Mm. Um, and uh, I am reading and learning. I'm not a technologist. I'm someone who has been deeply interested in tech, tech for almost 20 years. I'm not a coder. Um, but there are currently you know, nine patents for augmented reality contact lenses. Um, so the, the smartphone that you have in your hand right now is already obsolete, and your average person doesn't know that. Oh. Um, and I want us to close that gap, because until we close that gap, we can't control where we're going. Um, so that's the first thing, right? So I want black people to be at the forefront. I want us to leapfrog. Um, I also want to work to dispel a whole bunch of narratives around black people. 
in the United States and around the world, mm -hmm. right? If black people in the United States were our own country, we would be the 15th largest spender in the entire world. Mm -hmm. um, and we let this narrative around our capital investment sort of fall by the wayside. Um, and, and to me, being able to tell those stories and control those stories is really important because it shapes how we see ourselves, it shapes how our children see where they're going. Um, and I just, I want to fundamentally change how we see that. Um, for the folks in this room who are working, particularly in the art sector, um, I was on a review panel uh, a couple weeks ago where I taught, where it was, it was four museums. Some of you will probably know what review panel I'm talking about. Um, but I mentioned being really high on holograms. Like holograms to me are essentially a plug and play audience engagement way that will drive revenue for institutions that I believe those institutions are obsolete. I think a lot of your physical spaces we're building are obsolete. That's neither here nor there. Um, but if you want to bring people into an institution, holograms make sense. And um, I was essentially laughed at when I said that. Um, but you can do, um, I'm currently working on a, or beginning to work on a project um, involving the Black Panthers who are aging. Um, and we're at the point where it's relatively inexpensive to do mm. hours of volumetric 3D video with them so they can live on, right? There are intellectual property implica implications that I'm getting into. Um, for that, what happens when someone passes on and their personality lives in a museum that might be predominantly white-led, but their family is still living? How do we navigate that, right? Yeah. But I feel like black people should be having those conversations now. Yeah. Because if we don't have them now, people are going to continue to co-opt our personalities and our culture and profit from it and we're not gonna see any revenue. Um, so my five-year dream is to have us lead all of this conversation um, instead of just letting it happen to us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's it. Everything that you just said, I'm like, right, that's, some of that is literally a Black Mirror episode, Black Museum episode in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're not the ones writing and producing, right? Like, so, so there's some of this stuff where it's, um, it's, it's near science fiction, right? It's like near future stuff around tech um, that we experience and we're like, okay, I can start seeing some of our stories here. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really interesting. How do we become the protagonists, the, the, the producers, the writers, the authors um, of co-creating the, the, the future and, and, and being agents in closing that gap mm -hmm. between what is the near future and what is now? Um, knowing that technolo technology and, and some of those tools are, uh, are a critical bridge and nexus mm -hmm. around, around how we get there. Yeah, and I, I would say that my particular interest is black people, and how many folks notice new terms of service agreement from Lyft this week? Like, you've essentially you signed over a whole bunch of your rights in the new terms of service with Lyft agreement when you logged into your app and they asked you to agree to a new thing. Um, we're all kind of doing it. Mm. But you know we have to get better, like as a society, we've just we've got to we've got to stop. Yeah, there's so many different rabbit holes that I want to go down. So in a generic way, and then we'll open it up um, in a, a broader way. I'm wondering if you guys could each name something structurally that's impeding your work from really taking off. Like for for all of us to be able to shift to the paradigm that you all are espousing. What's something structural that you think we can actually work on? It might be, you know, we need, you know, more investment in black entrepreneurs to work in the digital. I mean, I'm making it up for you, but just as an example, it could be, it could be a technical thing, like SEC needs, we need to focus on this. Can you name something that helps all of us understand what might be some of the barriers to that yeah. progress? I can go. Um, so, I, because I think it, I think it, I think it ties um, together, not just to the work that we're doing. Um, we, we're also we're, so we're actually a five hundred one c six. So we do advocacy work um, and represent. We're sort of a chamber of commerce for work around cooperative businesses. Um, and most recently, um, we we were able to get a law passed um, a year ago under a Republican trifecta of federal government. Uh, which, by the way, was the first time that there's ever been a federal law um, enacted that explicitly named worker cooperatives mm -hmm. um, in, in the history of this country. And, uh, and part of it was around um, directing the Small Business Administration, um, which has all of these tentacles with the Small Business Development Centers, thousands of them all over the, the country, um, to just like learn up about worker ownership, 
and cooperatives and employee ownership. Mm -hmm. It additionally directs um, the, um, the SBA to do a study uh, around why the hell are cooperatives not allowed to get in on an existing federal program for small business administration loans. Um, they require a personal guarantee, so it's not that we're explicitly barred, but it's impossible. When you have multiple owners, and you're not just one family or two business owners launching a new initiative, right? So there's already, that's a bunch of capital that's already there. It's already mandated. You already have administrators and a full, you know, 50 states wide team of technocrats who are implementing this stuff and underwriting right. these loans. So there's a lot of stuff that it's like, actually, it wouldn't be that deep to just unlock and release some stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that that kind of thinking gets me to gets me to thinking about like, oh yeah, what are other ways that there's a really easy um, thing we either need to build up or unlock um, at a state, local, or federal level, such as things like public banking, right? right? And how that would make some of what Deborah's talking about more feasible to have some of those things flow or have, have um, the kind of pipeline and portfolios of the kind of investment that we're talking about more, more possible and feasible. Actually, I'm gonna piggyback on that. I, I won't call on Janelle right now, but Janelle's gonna be up here in a second at Sustainable Economies Law Center. And this, what you're talking about, like there are definitely, um, actually, I think it was Jason, um, our legal counsel, who told me this, and it's really impacted my thinking, which is that just consider that all the laws, rules, guide, guidances, and regulations are meant to set up the current system and keep it going. Yeah. So you have to actually have some legal expertise on your side, which I will tell you, when we first did our line item for Ambitious around legal, it was small. Mm -hmm. It's definitely gone up because now we realize they are our creative partner uh -huh. in trying to figure out all these workarounds. Like you're saying, like, how do co-ops actually access SBA lo loan money, which Silk um, is uh, work with City of, uh, U uh, City of Berkeley around things of that sort. So just to say... I'm glad you went there with, the, with your response because there's actually a lot that we can do to actually structurally start to shape um, the alternative systems so that it's actually easy to exert behavior and work within an alternative system because right now it's hard because we haven't created that space. I'll pick on the, le on the legal one again too. I, I, um, I want to say we could not do what we do without pro bono legal. It is million, we get millions of dollars a year. We do about 30, uh, 20 to 30 transactions a year. They are, you know, very innovative, groundbreaking transactions. They require a lot of legal. And so one of the things that we're talking to as we talk to these other cities is don't believe that you can't get that. Now, this is where we have to use different social capital in our networks. So part of that has to do with, so I'll give you an example. We have three law firms that were all begging to work with us, and the reason is they have a major attraction and retention problem for lawyers of color. And so they are desperate to put their young associates on projects like ours, also on Ujima, because they are having a lot of difficulty retaining talent. Wow. They are also multinational law firms that have offices in many of the cities that you all live in. So, so part of it is how do we use each other's social capital to unlock a resource like that that is a necessity for projects of our scale, these five to twenty million dollar funds, um, and build up those relationships. You get the last word. Oh God. Um, I, I think the, the barrier for us is, and I realize I talked a lot about the why, I didn't really say the how. So the, the big how that, um, that we're doing is we'll, we'll actually launch a distribution platform for XR content at the end of the year, which means that it's sort of we're hitting both ends in terms of education awareness and middle parts, uh, the actual creation of content. And then the end is, you know, Netflix of VR, right? Or BET, which might be sort of more, more appropriate. Um, in that, I think the, the, the struggle is um, the XR industry is developing largely like um, the film industry did and then the gaming industry um, and, the, and the kids with the skills um, to build games and just sort of the creative nature to build games. Um, I'm not seeing anyone, and I, I don't think philanthropy is going to keep me alive, right? So it's been helpful, but um, I don't think that's the path. However, the lack of recognition of the game industry and those skills as a value, as a as a viable creative part, a viable part of the creative 
ecosystem is essentially non-existent. There's no support for gamers of color to get into it. So they're coming out of school. They love playing games. Um, they're avid consumers of games, right? Like black people play video games. Um, they can't find a career in that because they're entering a sector that is remarkably racist and remarkably sexist. Um, so Gamergate, I mean, it's all largely happening outside of sort of the world of anyone who's paying attention to it. Um, but overtly, I mean, there was just drama this week about a, a guy who, um, never mind, I won't go down that, that hole. <laughs> Terrible. But the guy who's teaching people to play games had this disastrous Twitter thread this week. Um, there's not a lot of support for growing the ecosystem to have kids get into it. Um, adults are making independent games, and that's a hard lifestyle. So um, for me, it's really how do I find, um, and you use the uh, uh, a metaphor. I always use Oceans, like Oceans 11 or Oceans 8, when you're trying to like do something, and it's like everybody has their role. You need your heist team. Yeah, I need, it's a heist team. For me, I'm trying to crack the bank, right? Like, <laughs> You know, somebody's, somebody's coding, someone's got disguises, we're going in, we're, someone's setting, burning, a, burning a fire back there. Like, yeah. um, so I need more people to help me crack the safe, because um, that's a big pipeline that I'm trying to hold on my own, but having other folks in the ecosystem, um, I do feel kind of, I, there's other people who are working on theory. Um, Kamal Sinclair does a great job there, sort of on like why this is important and has been supporting the work, but I'm not seeing folks actually sort of down in the trenches helping to sort of support the, the entire ecosystem. Thank you for that. Um, there's a couple thoughts um, uh, that I'll just to kind of provide a little bit of an ambitious perspective. One is, and for some of the funders in this room who were with us at the uh, recent Grantmakers in the Arts Conference, I went on a little side note on this, and I really believe this, that the next sort of innovation that institutional foundations can do when it comes to their um, human resource capital is that over the last 15 years, they did a lot out of the CFO's office to build out PRI, MRI, all of those kinds of things. I actually think that an, uh, an underutilized resource um, on the payroll of foundations is their legal counsel. Mm -hmm. But to think about hiring legal counsel differently, mm -hmm. not as risk managers, but actually program partners, right? Um, wow, so yeah. that could be really interesting to sort of think about and take back to your institutions.